and welcome to this afternoon session um, where we are um, going to um, cover a session called Made in Africa. And um, as you'll see, as um, I give kind of a, a general um, introduction, really what we're talking about here is a body of work that we... Sorry, thanks, Dominic. <laughs> is a body of work that we conducted um, under a program called Learning to Compete um, with a new and new wider. Um, so we're taking this opportunity to kind of present some of our, our main findings, our main story um, from, that, from that book. Um, so the structure of the session is that um, I will present um, an overview of what our thinking was when we came up with this idea, um, some of the, the key messages and findings that we got from that. Um, and then I will ask two of the, the key people who um, were researching on this program to present specific um, papers um, and results um, from some of the more detailed econometric work. My plan is then to, if we still have time, to come back and say a few words just about the policy implications that we came up with at the end of the book, and then we have um, some comments from some discussants. Um, so um, to begin with, just to give a bit of motivation, when we were coming up with this um, topic and, and thinking about how important it is to think about industrialization in Africa, um, we you know, were noting in particular the fact that Africa has deindustrialized um, significantly since um, the um, 1980s. So you know, there was a period of industrialization, a period of, of growth in industry, and then really it just um, has flatlined then in the more, in the more recent years. Um, and to illustrate that even further and to highlight the deficit in manufacturing in Africa, you can see here some, I think, very startling um, numbers that show the manufacturing value added share of GDP for sub-Saharan Africa on average, and then comparing that to the developing country average. And on all of these measures on manufacturing added share of GDP, um, per capita, export share and total exports, manufacturing exports uh, per capita, you can see um, a significant lag in the case of the sub-Saharan African countries compared with other um, developing countries. Um, so this really kind of is just to highlight that, that, that gap, the fact that there, why is there so little industry in Africa? And this is the question that we sought out to answer in this um, research program. Um, so again, kind of just as a motivation, it's important to try to establish, I guess, why industry matters. Um, and the, the kind of three key things that we focused on um, in our project was to think about the fact that industry matters for growth. And particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, if you look across the different sectors and you look at the productivity differences across those sectors, there are large differences um, in output per worker. So there's an, an opportunity to have a substantial um, growth payoff if you move resources from lower productivity to higher productivity sectors. So it's not that in um, sub-Saharan Africa there was not movement or, or some form of, um, of, of transformation happening, um, but the movement that you see was from low productivity agriculture to slightly higher productivity service sector jobs. You're not seeing that shift from, from, um, from agriculture into, into industry. Um, and, and you know, given the fact that labor productivity in manufacturing is so significantly higher than that in agriculture, then it's a really missed potential and there's a lot of potential there for growth coming from this, from this source. So the first point, industry matters for growth. The second point, of course, is that industry matters for creating good jobs. Um, so while the official unemployment rates um, in sub-Saharan Africa never appeared that high, um, the jobs that are there are very poor quality jobs. So 75% of workers in sub-Saharan Africa are in what are called vulnerable jobs. Um, and many are engaged in usually barely profitable household enterprises that are formed because there's simply no alternative jobs. Um, and these are lower quality in terms of wages, in terms of job conditions, in terms of benefits, in terms of security. Um, so this kind of lack of jobs, again, means that you know, with industrialization um, and with industrial development, you will have a better opportunity for better jobs, for more employment. And this can obviously accelerate the pace of uh, poverty reduction. And um, even more so with the um, exploding population and the need to create jobs for a, a massive um, growing young population in particular, um, understanding whether industrialization is, can be a reality and, and is something that can create jobs is, is ever more important. Um, and the third point, um, I guess, that kind of motivates is the fact that what you make matters. So 
Um, the more diversified your, your production base, the more complexity you have in your production base, um, and in particular in your export structures, um, the, the higher incomes will be. So countries that produce and export more sophisticated products tend to grow faster. So there's a strong case for diversification and a strong case for kind of um, moving up the value chain in terms of, of the types of um, goods and services that are being produced. So um, on the basis of this, um, this, this discussion and this kind of introduction, the, the two quick key questions that, that uh, we attempted to answer um, in our study was, can Africa break in? And if so, how can that be done? Um, so this led to this collaborative research program called Learning to Compete that was between you and you wider, the African Development Bank and the Brookings Institution. Um, and it really involved a large collection of researchers um, within the UNU wider, ne wider network, but also reaching out to many um, researchers um, in the countries that we were working in and um, to come up with a series of, of, of research outputs that have contributed to our thinking on this issue. One, the two um, main outputs, I guess, um, substantive outputs are the Made in Africa uh, book, um, published by Brookings Institution that a lot of the kind of what we're presenting today is based on, um, and also another book which was um, um, a set of case studies from all of the different studies, different countries that we worked in that really brought together what we know um, uh, individual African countries in terms of the, the level of industrialization, the key constraints to industrialization um, in those countries. In addition to that, there was, there was um, another, another book about the, the policy side of things and also um, a special issue of the Journal of African Economies on, on exporting. So it's this kind of body of output and other outputs that, that we, are, we are talking about today. So um, one of the, um, the, the, the kind of things, I guess, again, to kind of think about um, can Africa break in? In other words, can Africa industrialize? Some of this was discussed in, um, in this, mor this morning's session with John Page's se session on industries without smokestacks. So I won't um, dwell too long on it. There's a bit of, bit of repetition there. Um, but understanding whether Africa can break in is important in order that for them to, us then to think about how can Africa break in and what are the key drivers there. Um, so there are a number of opportunities um, for sub-Saharan Africa, in particular the changing circumstances um, in Asia. There's rising costs in China. Labor costs have, um, have doubled between 2005 and 2010, and again between 2010 and 2016. You also see a lot of increase in domestic demand in Asia that um, is also um, um, driving demand for, and, and for, for, manufacturing, um, for manufacturing goods. Um, and also the Asian economies are moving up the technology ladder. So they're producing ever more um, complex, um, complex goods, ever more sophisticated goods, and therefore they're opening up an opportunity for, for less sophisticated producers to enter the market. And one of the comments made from the floor this morning by, um, by Justin Lin was that you know, there, there are many, many millions of jobs up for grabs coming from China with that move. Um, and moreover, China is also becoming increasingly globally engaged, uh, particularly in Africa. So there's opportunities for FDI from China to help um, with this um, industrialization process. Secondly, of course, trade and tasks um, represents another important opportunity. Um, Production processes um, in manufacturing are now very much decomposed into a variety of different tasks, um, and this is facilitated by um, lower transport costs or communication costs means that each stage of the production can be produced in any um, location. Um, so it's very efficient for, for, for these tasks to be located in these different countries. And in fact, um, as much as 80% of all global trade is now in, um, is between kind of networks of multinational corporations producing tasks um, at different stages of uh, the production process. Um, so this has potential as well because it means that you know new manufacturing um, firms don't have to under, understand or grasp the production processes required for a full product from start to finish. They can just specialize in particular tasks um, in, um, in, in, in the value chain. Um, of course, there are challenges here because this requires low transport costs, it requires efficient trade logistics, good communications and so on. And that, um, as we know, is a challenge for um, parts of sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and then, of course, the, 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 the topic of this morning's talk, um, this morning's session, was industries without smokestacks. And essentially, um, this is suggesting that, you know, there is huge opportunities in what we would call non-traditional um, industries. So um, tradable services, agro-industrial value chains all represent opportunities 
um, because they too exhibit similar characteristics to manufacturing industries in that they benefit from technological change, from they can benefit from productivity um, improvements, um, they have they can benefit from agglomeration, from economies of scale, and they can produce higher productivity jobs. They can produce better jobs. So there are opportunities um, in there too, and that was discussed at length in this, in this morning session. But of course, the, the key issues or the key necessary conditions are one, keeping labor costs low, and the other, increasing firm level productivity. And it's the second issue that um, was the focus of this body of work that we, we, we worked on in the Learning to Compete project, which is um, how do we increase firm level productivity? What are the drivers that we can think about and the, the drivers that we can um, discuss? And the three drivers that we um, focused on in our work were exports and competition and how that can improve firm level productivity. Um, secondly, firm capabilities. Um, so this is kind of the, the knowledge and working practices of firms um, and the, and the opportunities for capabilities to spill over um, to other firms through supply chain linkages was another important kind of focus of our investigations. And thirdly, agglomerations where we're thinking about um, industrial clusters and the spillovers that can emerge from these kinds of industrial um, clusters. And also one of the, the things that we've, one of the other reasons why we've really focused on agglomerations is that there was so little evidence um, for whether, um, for example, special economic zones work in Africa. There is very little evidence for well, what are the drivers of agglomeration and what are they, the, the potential, what's the potential for these, for these spillovers. So they are kind of the three main core areas that we set out to investigate in the programme. And um, within the programme, we had a, a three-track approach. First of all, we set out to try and document as much information that we have um, about industrialization in sub-Saharan Africa. So we used detailed case studies um, of industrialization, the evolution of policies in relation to industrialization, and, and we did that for, for um, 11 different countries, nine African countries and two Asian countries. And the, the, that collection of case studies was published in the Manufacturing Transformation um, volume. Um, we then did a number of, um, we did a very large exercise in, in determining what data are available. Because for a lot of this work, if you want to do some, um, some econometric analysis, you need good quality micro-level data. So we did a full data inventory of what we could find from these countries, and we set out to do a variety of different econometric analyses um, to try and see how much evidence we can gather on these three particular issues from each of these um, country cases. Um, and then finally, um, one of the, the things that would be presented and today, um, we did qualitative surveys of FDI firms. So we took a different approach to the pure econometric approach, and we really tried to dig in to understand some of the, the mechanisms going on um, under the FDI and, and the potential for FDI spillovers. Um, so that was kind of the approach that we took. So um, I want to kind of summarize some of the main findings before going into some of the detail on, on one or two of the studies. So as I said, one of the bodies of work that we, that we looked at was about exports and productivity. And um, we managed to find um, enough detailed micro firm level data to study the issue of, of, of learning by exporting and whether firms learn by exporting from six different countries. So from Cambodia, Ethiopia, Mozambique, Senegal, Tunisia, and Vietnam. And they formed one of the, the special issues in, in Journal of African Economies that I spoke about. And um, so of course, econometric issues here are quite, um, they're, they're, they're quite complex in terms of identification and dealing with the selection into exporting issue. Um, and then once you have selection, are you actually observing learning or is it just selection of the best um, and most productive firms into exporting? So these are all kind of issues that we took very seriously in our analysis and we developed a framework for analyzing the data in a, in a consistent way as, um, across, the different, across the different countries. And overall, our findings, um, on the one hand, confirmed our expectations that there is a lot of selection into exporting. So the more productive firms do select into exporting. Um, the larger firms are more likely to export. The foreign firms are more likely to be the ones that export, not surprisingly. We did find evidence of learning, and that's not like there's been cases where learning has not been observed. But in our case, um, once you control for selection, exporting further increases uh, productivity. And we found that, in particular, those learning effects spill over or are, are stronger for the domestically owned firms. Um, the exporting of more sophisticated products, which again is not so surprising. Um, when you're exporting to higher income markets or more distant markets, in fact, you find that the learning effects are larger um, and the learning effects are, are largest in those initial years of exporting with some of the, 
the benefits um, dissipating over time. But we also found some surprises that had not really been documented um, in, in, in other studies. Um, one of the interesting things was that uh, many African exporters are what we would say are born global. Both FDI firms that just um, establish in order to export from a particular country, but also local domestic firms. We found a lot of evidence that they were born global also. Um, so few firms learn to export over time. So the, the few firms, if you're not born global, it's unusual for you to select into exporting. Um, so you, it's hard to learn to export. Um, but once you start, then it's quite uh, persistent over time with not so much exit from export observed in the data. Um, and the productivity premium is higher with um, a low um, national or sectoral export participation rates. So if you are in, a, in an economy where there's not much exporting happening and you enter into exporting, you get a much um, higher premium. So that was kind of on the export side, um, which I've gone into in a, a bit more detail than the others because um, we've no kind of paper talk. I want to kind of summarize all of the, the, the details from, from those papers um, rather than going into to detail on one. Um, on firm capabilities, um, which um, John will talk a bit more about in a while, um, specifically on the qualitative work that we did with the FDI firms, um, here we did a number of studies um, from Cambodia, Ghana, Kenya, Ethiopia, Mozambique, Uganda, and Vietnam, where we were looking at this at, at firm capabilities um, in particular. Um, and one of the things that emerged was uh, it was very evident that Africa lacks capable mid-sized firms, so in the 50 to 70 worker range. Um, and management and finding managers to handle the size of firm um, appears to be um, a particular constraint um, in terms of growing um, capabilities. Um, but we did find, um, consist, you know, in kind of in reference to the previous slide, that firm learn, firms learn capabilities from, from exporting itself. Um, but we also found evidence that firm to firm knowledge transfers are a very important source of capabilities. So FDI is a major source of higher capabilities, and we found evidence of spillovers, particularly vertical linkages along the supply chain, mattering for um, firm capabilities and mattering for, for learning. Um, and as I said, John would speak a bit more about that um, in, a, in a while. Um, secondly, on um, agglomeration, agglomeration and capabilities kind of also fall in, within the kind of the same umbrella. And here, the data demands are much more difficult, of course, because you need to have location data for the firms um, in order to understand agglomeration. So there are fewer examples from our cases where we could actually do some, some quantitative work on this. But where we could, um, we could see evidence that industrial clusters do confer significant productivity gains. So the jobs that are created in clusters, they have additional impacts on productivity, on the productivity of, of other firms. Um, so firms in close proximity learn from each other. Firms in the clusters benefit from a broader pool of skilled labor. We found evidence of this. And clusters also help link uh, local firms with foreign firms. And also with export markets. So there's kind of a, a kind of a, um, um, a kind of a spillover between kind of clusters and special economic zones and exporting as well. Um, and they're kind of mutually beneficial to each other. And we found that the cluster effects are the stronger in the, the lower income countries, um, and the large firms um, indeed benefit more than the than the small firms. And again, this comes down to uh, kind of a capabilities and um, understanding capabilities argument there. So that's kind of the summary of the detailed findings that um, we, we got from the, the more econometrics uh, and quantitative studies. Um, and of course, from, from these kind of three slides, really what we can conclude from uh, this body of work was that these three topics are not mutually exclusive. And when you're thinking about them from a policy perspective, and I'll come back to this um, um, when I conclude later, um, they really go hand in hand. Um, and they are quite complementary to each other, and that's something that should, should be borne in mind. Thank you.